do notice that the more wood he cut, the less wood he had. So he decided he was going to see who was taking his firewood. You can just imagine the scene. He's there on his property. Guy one shows up. And there's a confrontation. As it was told to me by that guy number one, that day in the church building, there was some strong language. There were accusations of theft. There were puffed up chests. And there were threats of calling the sheriff. After I listened in stunned silence, as this guy very boisterously told me this tale, I thought, when he stopped, I thought for about 10 seconds, and then this is what I said, you are two grown men who claim to be Christians. Go work it out. If you can't work it out, if both of you come see me, I'll be glad to sit down and see if I can mediate it and see what we can figure <coughs> out. But you are two grown men who don't need me for this. I will never, ever forget what he said to me that day. With his face bright red and huffing and puffing, he said, I knew that's what you were going to say. <laughs> okay, then why is there a problem? Because he stormed out, and I can honestly tell you to this day, that was never resolved. He never came back. But I'm convinced both of the guys knew what I would say, but he thought he'd give it a shot, and just maybe he could convince me that I needed to be on his side, or that I needed to do things his way. In that instance, what he thought I was going to say was dead on, even though he wished it were. But sometimes it goes the other way. Right? I had a young man work for me in the restaurant business, and he wasn't doing so well, and I knew I was going to have to let him go. I was going to have to fight him. And it broke my heart because I was pretty convinced it was going to break his. I thought he's never going to recover from this. This is going to destroy him for the rest of his life. And when the day comes I had to fire him, he said, thank you. I hate this job. <laughs> he was so glad he didn't When I said, you don't ever have to come back here again, he was the happiest guy I've seen in a long time. So that one, I was wrong in what I thought was going to happen, but I was happy. I was wrong. Finally, before we get to our core text for today's stop in our walk through the New Testament, I want to tell you about one more interaction with expectation. Because that's what we're going to talk about this morning. This past week, I had to tell some people something that I dreaded telling them. I didn't want to tell them because I was afraid of the response that I was going to get or the reaction that it was going to cause. I'm happy to tell you that I can't tell you how wrong I was about the reaction and how blessed I was by the reaction that I actually got. And I'll tell you more about that later. But right now, you can open your Bible or your app or you can follow along on the screen as I read. Uh, we're going to be reading mostly from Acts chapter 4, if you want to turn there. And what we're going to read is a record of how different groups of people reacted to different situations that they were faced with. The situations that we're going to read about actually started back in chapter 3, and I'm going to go back there and, and talk about that a little bit. But what I want us to determine, are we seeing an expected reaction from these people? Are these people responding to the situations in the way that we expect they would, or maybe even in the way that we would? The reason I'm asking this question is to remind us of two things. First is that we should not assume how people are going to react. Because sometimes we're wrong. And the second thing is that there's a modeled way of how we as followers of Jesus should react to every situation. And especially to the situation we're going to look at this morning. So the situation starts, as I said, in chapter 3 of the book of Acts. Peter and John are at the temple. And they come across a guy who's been unable to walk since birth. And later on it says that he's 40 years old. He's never been able to walk. And he comes to the same day at the temple every day to beg for money. I'm going to go out on a limb and say every day when he comes he has expectation. He expects people to respond to him in one of two ways. They will either feel sorry for him and help him, or they will be indifferent to him and ignore him. 
He was in the same place and saw many of the same people every day, and he knew what to expect. What does that look like in 2018? I think he looks like the guy on the expressway right now. The sign. We need some help. He's got the same expectations, doesn't he? There are some people who are going to feel sorry for him, and some people who are going to help him. There are other people that are going to be indifferent to him and ignore him. This person on the expressway ramp or anywhere else knows to expect one or the other of those reactors, right? Those are the two most common. But what if we reacted different? What if we reacted like Peter and John reacted in this story that we read in Acts chapter 3? This is what Peter said to the man. Silver or gold I do not have, but what I do have I give you. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, walk. In this instance, it says the man allowed Peter and John to take him by the hand and help him stand up. I'm going to say again, that was an unexpected response. If not by Peter and John, then certainly by the rest of the people there. Because you would think the expected response would be, I can't stand up and walk. I haven't walked in 40 years. I know, and I'm speaking for myself just as well as everybody else, we can make assumptions about the people that we see begging. People that we see in need. And I'm not talking about assumptions about why they are where they are or what caused them to be in the position that they're in. I'm talking about assuming that they want our money and they don't really care about Jesus. Because that's what we assume sometimes. We have the most valuable thing we could give to anybody. Sometimes we don't bother. Because we don't think that's what they want. You know what? Guess what? Sometimes that's exactly the reaction we'll get from people. They don't want to hear about Jesus. Maybe they just want a couple of bucks. But what about that one person? What about that one person that we might encounter that might allow us to take their hand and lead them to start walking with Jesus? As I was preparing this message and, and trying to think, because we're always trying to think of ways to balance this situation. How do we help people and really help people? I've come up with an idea that I'm going to try and I don't know if it'll work or not, but I'm going to carry little notes in my truck. And they will say something to the effect that I can't help you monetarily or I can't help you a lot monetarily, but I can tell you that Jesus loves you. And if you want to talk about that, you call me. I'm going to put my phone number on there. And if you want to try that, you can put my phone number on there. Or the church phone number on there. But there's got to be some way that we can develop that we can let people in need know that they need peace. I've mentioned before when my wife and I were in Indianapolis once, and I found a guy sitting on the sidewalk. And I followed the lead of another man that I knew, and I sat down with him and I said, look, before I give you anything, I want you to tell me your story. And he did. And I said, has anybody ever told you that Jesus loves you? And he said, yeah. And I'm still trying to love myself, but until I do, nothing else is going to help. Ah. I think we need to start talking to you. Uh, Jesus. Now let's get back to the rest of chapter 3. In response to the reaction of the people, it says they were filled with wonder and amazement at what had happened. Peter then takes the opportunity to share the gospel with them. Some people would be filled with wonder and amazement today if we took the time to tell them that God loves them and that Jesus died for them just like he died for us. 
not finally we get to chapter 4, and we can see and relate to the reactions of two groups of people. The first group of people consists of what I like to refer to as the temple big shots, the people in charge of the temple. And this is what it says. The priests and the captain of the temple guard and the Sadducees came up to Peter and John while they were speaking to the people. They were greatly disturbed because the apostles were teaching the people, proclaiming in Jesus the resurrection of the dead. They seized Peter and John because it was evening, and because it was evening, they put them in jail until the next day. The next day, the rulers, the elders, and the teachers of the law met in Jerusalem. And as the high priest was there, so were Caiaphas, John, Alexander, and others of the high priest's family. They had Peter and John brought before them and began to question them. By what power or what name did you do this? I think it's pretty well known because of our studies of Scripture that this was the expected reaction of the religious leaders. They were greatly disturbed. In all actuality, they were threatened. Because these people were doing things not in their name, but in Jesus' name. Because if you notice, it's not the healing of the lame man that they're disturbed by. What they're disturbed by is that Peter and John are preaching resurrection of the dead in Jesus' name. And the Sadducees didn't believe or teach physical resurrection, and they didn't want anyone else doing it either. You want a trick to remember that it was this group that didn't believe in physical resurrection? I read that one preacher taught his congregation that you remember that one day these men would be sad. You see. Moving on, we've seen the verses that we just read that people were listening to and believing what Peter and John were teaching. So rather than challenge the doctrine, the leaders challenged the motive. By what power or what name did you do this? I'm convinced that the expected response was for Peter and John to take credit for the healing of that man. That's what these religious leaders expected. I've seen many times where people have criticized the church in our times today for different things, questioning the motives of the people involved. Even when we do good things, people think we're doing it to make ourselves look good, or at the very least to ease our conscience, to be able to say we helped those less fortunate than us. And Christians can be quick to become defensive when what we should do is react the way Peter did. Social media people, you know, Christians can be quick to become defensive and start arguing. But if we do what Peter did, we turn the focus again to Jesus. Peter didn't argue. He simply and boldly shared the truth about sin and death and salvation in Jesus. Period. Done. That's what he did. As happens in our lives a lot, these so-called leaders didn't listen. And to be honest, that was probably the expected reaction. Then there's another encounter. Where are we going to begin at verse 16? What are we going to do with these men, they ask? Everyone living in Jerusalem knows they have performed a notable sign, and we cannot deny it. But to stop this thing from spreading any further among the people, we must warn them to speak no longer to anyone in this name. They called them in again and commanded them not to speak or teach at all in the name of Jesus. Does that sound familiar? It's happening. Could it happen in 2018? Yes. Could the day come when we're told to no longer teach or even speak in the name of Jesus? It sure looks like it. I know a prison chaplain who was let go because he preached and prayed in the name of Jesus. Because he might offend someone. So it can happen. If and when that happens, this should be our response. But Peter and John replied, which is right in God's eyes? 
to listen to you or to him. You be the judges. As for us, we cannot help speaking about what we have seen and heard. We can't help but talk about Jesus. We should be so excited every single day that we can't help telling people what we've seen and heard about Jesus. One of the things that we have to get better at doing, and I'll admit it's not easy, we have to get better at letting people know the reason we talk about Jesus. It's not because we think we're better than they are. It's not because we believe we're right and they're wrong. We have to come up with ways of letting them know it's because we love them. Not only do we not want them to go to hell, which, yeah, that's a big, big matter, a big concern, but we also want them to experience the love of Christ and the hope for the future that comes from having a relationship with Him while we're here. I can't say enough about how much more bearable this life is when you know this is not all there is. It's a lot easier to get through every day, isn't it? When there's hope for the future? I can't emphasize enough the, the amount of peace that comes from knowing that no matter how bad things get, or listen to the church, no matter how good things get, the best is yet to come. Not only yet to come, it's promised to those who know Jesus and his love. Now we look at the final reaction in this particular account. It says that they, Peter and John, were threatened more, and then they were released. So what did they do next? How did they react to everything they had been through? Did they get the people all riled up? Did they argue with their persecutors? No. They did what we should do. They reacted in the way that we should react any time we feel threatened or persecuted or anything else. On their release, Peter and John went back to their own people and reported all that the chief priests and the elders had said to them. When they heard this, this is the important part, church, they raised their voices together in prayer to God. They prayed. If you go through and read that entire prayer, you'll see that they prayed for the strength to speak God's word boldly. That's what they prayed for. Wait, that's what they prayed for first. The second thing they prayed for is that God would show himself to the world through his son Jesus. Now, I don't know if anybody's told you this yet, but until Jesus gets back, that's us. We are the body of Christ. We are the hands and feet of Jesus until he returns. How will people see his glory if they don't see it through his church? How will people see his glory if we're not kind to each other? If we're not kind to each other, how are we going to be kind to anybody else? We can sometimes anticipate a certain reaction. Well, my prayer is that we'll never be shy about mentioning the name of Jesus when the opportunity, opportunity arises. You never know when someone might show you an unexpected reaction. And that they might be glad that you decided to share Christ's love with them. You may be the first one. Somebody did it for you at some time in your life. You never know when someone will listen. Again, you never know when someone will take your hand and begin their walk with Jesus. We cannot help but talk about what Jesus has done in our lives and what we have seen and heard from others. We heard a story in Sunday school this morning that was just amazing. It entered, it was insane. About what God did for a little church and through a little church. We can't help but speak about Jesus. 
that someone may be listening. And maybe that person is even here today. Maybe there's someone here that's always expected to see Christians react with arrogance or with indifference. Because that's what they've experienced before. But today they've heard that we can't help but talk about Jesus because of what he has done for us. And what he has done for us is available to anyone. That's person, if that person is you, that's going to be the simple invitation for today. I can't give you gold or silver. If you'll walk up here and take my hand, we will show you the love of Christ and what that can do to change your life and your world. That's the invitation of Christ. God, we love you. We are so thankful for your word and for the lessons that we can learn from it. Lessons that we see over and over and over again. My prayer today is that we would be the church that you designed us and left us here to be. That we would carry on the work that Christ started while he was here and we would carry on to the day he returns. Father, I pray if there's anybody here who's never made that decision, that's never understood how much you love them and what you've done for them, that they would make a decision today to start that walk. Or maybe somebody here who just needs to be prayed with, and we have people that want to do that. Father, we just want your love and your power to carry us out into this world so that others will come to know just how much you love them. We love you, we praise you. You are the one who is worthy.